if you turn in your Bibles this morning to, to 2 Peter 3, while you're doing that, I, I, I'm going to talk to the adults here a little bit. Can you, uh, any of y'all remember the movie a few years back with, uh, I think it was, uh, not Ice-T, but called, are we there yet? Yeah. Yeah, you remember that? Any of you ever had that experience with your own children? Yeah. Going on a trip. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And when, when it started out in, in my car as a child, it was usually about 10 minutes down the road. <laughs> and I was the one telling, asking Dad, are we there yet? Can you go faster? Hurry up. i got to go to the bathroom. Are we there yet? Whatever it might be. Then I had kids of my own. And then grandkids. And about 10 or 11 years ago, we were taking our grandchildren uh, to California for a church conference. And we thought, hey, we'll, we'll go to California. We'll see the beach and all the sights between Illinois and uh, California. We got my oldest granddaughter who just graduated. She was, you know, about six or seven. I didn't realize how well she could read. She gets in the car. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And she's like, okay, Papa, how long is it going to take? I said, well, as soon as we get to Colorado, we'll stop for the night. We're going to go from Illinois to Colorado one day. Okay? She never once said over there yet. Now, our brother's every five minutes. Yeah. But the minute we hit the Colorado State Board, so Papa, let's hit Colorado. I'm done. <laughs> the next hotel with a pool, I'm done. <laughs> and she's still at 18 is that same way. But I begin to think about that is, I see that same attitude a lot today in the church. And, and as I was reading 2 Peter, I kind of see that kind of attitude that Peter's trying to talk to the people of his day that had that same attitude when it comes to the end times and the return of Christ. That idea, are we there yet? This is getting bad. I've had enough. Are we there yet? And Peter is writing to remind us that we're not there yet. My grandsons and I figured out a little plan is that Tell them where Illinois is. I told them where California was, and I had to mark out on our rearview mirror so they'd go, Papa, and I just point about how much farther we had to go on the mirror, and they could tell. Uh, their dad did that with them every time they went on a trip. And Peter today is writing to us about that things that we can see that will show that we're not there yet, and that's okay because we still got work to do. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Yeah. Almighty God, I want to thank you today for your patience with us as at times we get frustrated like children. We're ready for things to happen. We're bored or we're, we're maybe too much excited or whatever it might be, but we're wanting you to return. So Lord, and that same problem was going on in Peter's day. So Lord, as we gather, may you open our hearts and minds to yeah. see what Peter had to say, not only to the people of his day, but to yeah. us. Those who have waited patiently for a long time for your return. Help us understand what it means, what the day means, where we're at yes. along this journey. And how we can live until you say we're here. It's time to finish. Mm -hmm. Lord, bless this word in this time. And I thank you mm -hmm. for these people who have gathered consistently through this pandemic. Who love each other and are always there to support each other. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and following says, This is now my this now, this is now beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. In them I'm trying to arouse your sincere intention by reminding you that you should remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior, spoken through the apostles. First of all, you must understand this. That in the last day, scoffers will come, scoffing and indulging in their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They deliberately ignored this fact by the word of God, heavens existed long ago. And earth was formed out of water and by means of water through which the world of that time was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word... The present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the gods. So Peter begins to write to the people and to us to remind us, to kind of spur us on 
to challenge us to remember the words that were already spoken yeah. time and time again. And I don't know about you, but I am a child, and sometimes I forget what Dad told me. <laughs> Living proof right now, <laughs> my dad and my fire chief told me to always check the ladder before you jump off on it. I always check to make sure it's set right. Well, I forgot to do what Dad told me. Oh. And I forgot. And Peter's writing to the people to say, don't forget what Dad said about what's going to happen in this world. That there are going to be scoffers. Has anybody read the news lately? Watch TV? There are scoffers, people who are ridiculing things of God. They're saying, well, okay, they're, kind, they're not atheists, they're not agnostic, they're kind of deists. They're saying, all right, there, there might be a God, but where's he at? He started this big planet and then he left us alone. Nothing's changing. He's not coming back, so I really don't believe that there is one. That's where we're at. They make fun of everything in the divine reality. Yeah. Ever wonder why? Why is the world so wanting to deny that there is a God? Very simply, I believe it's because God's truth interferes with their lifestyle. <laughs> I will tell you, when I was doing things that I knew were against my mom and dad's lifestyle, I didn't. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a 3,000 miles away to get away from them. I didn't want to tell them what was going on, what I was doing. And we're children. We're all children. And the same thing was happening in Peter's time, in Noah's time, in our time. People don't want to give up their immoral lifestyles. Right. So they deny that this is the word of God. They deny that there is a God. Right. And if there is, and they have to tell me that I am not, that I can't be who I want to be, that I can't be transgender, transgender fluid, whatever it might be, then I don't want to believe there's God and you're hateful if you tell me the truth. And if we're honest, we're kind of the same way, aren't we? We don't always want to follow the things that God tells us to do, and so we kind of right. ignore that scripture. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to maybe gossip or uh, maybe focusing on the things, uh, the worldly at pursuits of wealth and security and things. Well, we kind of ignore those things, so we can understand that. But it has gone to a whole new level, and Peter wants us to remember that that's already been talked about. It's nothing new. What we are facing today is nothing new under the sun. Remember Noah's time? They went and did what they wanted to do up until the moment it started raining. Mm -hmm. They made fun of him for building that boat. You get a chance if you're ever up in near Ohio, Kentucky, they, they've got a life size model. Mm -hmm. Go see it. But people thought he was crazy. They made fun of him. They make fun of us today when we follow the things that are happening. But here's the thing that we need to remember. They can deny it all they want. Turn with me, but if they look into the world, if they really look, they will see where God has been always. Everywhere we go, everything we do and say points to God and how he intervenes in human life. They'll say, well, there's evil. Where's God? Well, God is intervening in other ways and places we don't always understand, but he intervenes. Romans 1, 18 through 21 says this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, His eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things He has made. Mm -hmm. So they are without excuse. <clears throat> For, the, for though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were dark. Look around you in this world. The rain last night, the weather last night, the individual attributes of God are everywhere. I had a discussion with a grandson uh, over the weekend, last weekend, and he was like, well, Papa... 
I'm like, oh, here we go. They're going to want to debate the preacher. Mm -hmm. And because he is a freshman, and he has learned all about the Big Bang, and all about <laughs> evolution, and all about everything like that, and he's like, there is no grand designer, Papa. There, there is no God, science, and all this, and we had a long debate. And I finally looked at him and I said, who created that first molecule that your scientists say? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. So, so I said, you're really wanting me to believe that out of nothing came everything. He's like, yeah. I said, well, I think God designed it. And he goes, well, then who created God? I said, no, holy, you just asked me to believe that nothing was created out of nothing. I said, I'm going to ask you to believe that there was a creator who was always dead. It's the same thing. He's like, well, how do you know? I said, from the day I held your brother in my arms, because I wasn't there when my kids were born, I adopted them. I said, the day I held your brother in my arms, I knew there was a God, because everything was right in the world. And I also know how hard it is for a person to get pregnant. And not only did your mother get pregnant once, she got married pregnant four times. So there's four variables. And all of the science, we, I said, go to school and look at your periodic table and how intrinsic it is. Because right now, we can see God in his invisible attributes. It's there. But the world will say, no, it's not. They will deny that. They will scoff because they don't want to know that there is a God. Because that means that they have to change their life. But that's okay. Because Peter's reminding us that that is still, it's been going on for thousands of years. People are going to make fun of creation. But he goes on in verse 8 to kind of pull us back in, not worrying about the scoffers, not worrying about the end times. Because, he says, but do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promises, some think of slowness but is patient with you. I think the King, uh, I think King James or says it is long-suffering with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. There's a reason God's waiting. We may not fully understand it. We're done with this world. I, I, I'm done with some of it. When I watch Fox News and CNN and all the crazy stuff that goes on, but he's like, now hold it. we got to understand that our vision of time. Don't overlook it. Because though we may think it's a long time, it's just been a day or two for God. That's right. He's got a greater plan. Don't get frustrated with the, the timetable. Don't look at what appears to be slowness. Don't, be, don't worry about it because there's something else going on. The day of the Lord is going to come like that, like a thief in the night. And then immediately the heavens are going to pass away with all the loud noise and all the elements we will dissolve with fire and the earth and everything in it that's been done will be dissolved. Be wiped out. I think Paul's telling us, or Peter's telling us to, don't worry about that because all the things we've been focusing on, the worldly problems, the worldly things, the worldly wealth, the worldly uh, trying to move up the corporate ladder, we're all going to be dissolved mm -hmm. in a moment's notice. And then what we've done will be made shown to be true. He's calling us, I see him, to focus not on the worldly values. Because when the day comes, when the day of the Lord comes, and we'll get there. We're not there yet. We're about halfway. If I ask God where we're on the mirror, he might say, well, towards the end of the road, I don't know. He may get frustrated with me going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> but the word is, Jeff, quit focusing on the end. Focus on where you're at. Amen. Because all of this stuff that you're worried about is going to pass away. In a moment, in a flash, it will be gone. So once that happens, what sort of persons ought we to be in leading the life?
lives of all of us. If all that's going to happen, what should we be doing? How now shall we live in this time frame between God's coming first and God's second coming? How should we live? <clears throat> well, first of all, we should be living lives of holiness and godliness. Doing what's right. Doing what's just. Like the thing today. Picking up those gems. The youth message. Picking up those gems. Spending time with God. Doing the things that God wants us to do. Yeah. Every day. Right. And you know what the cool thing is? When we do that, Peter writes in verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Now, when I first read that many years ago, I thought, hey, I got a lot of power. I can hasten the day of the Lord's coming. No, <laughs> I can't. That's not what that means. What I realized once I had children is if you can distract them, the trip goes a lot quicker. <laughs> you get to the end, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, we're here. I am so thankful for portable DVDs and cell phones. <laughs> yeah. and long when, when my kids were little, I'm like, I'm not spending the money on that. It's too expensive. When we went to California, my daughter goes, I've got them their own individual little DVD players. I've got them their own little headphones, and I've got everything that they need. And you know what? We would just put, put in their DVDs. They didn't like the one that was playing in the car. We had just bought a car, and it had its own DVD player. Wow. And you could drop the window, uh, the, the screen, and they could look at it, and then they could have it here for them. And from Illinois to Colorado, it's a 14-hour drive. I didn't have one fight. With the wow. I didn't have to threaten, other than like, Papa, can we go to the bathroom? And that was it. Because they were distracted about something they enjoyed. And I think Paul, Peter's calling us to do the same thing. To be distracted about to the things we're enjoying, the things of God. Let's get focused on those, and suddenly, the Lord will be here. It won't seem like a chore. It won't seem like a long journey. It won't cause us fear. It won't cause us sadness. In fact, it'll be joyful. Because all of a sudden, we're going, oh, well, God's here. I, wait, i got more stuff I want to do. <laughs> Instead of going, oh, thank God he's finally here. You know, they'll be more like my, my granddaughter's like, I'm done. And we won't be like that. The boys are like, oh, but I want to watch another movie. If we're more worried about doing the things of God, we won't have to focus on the bad things. Right. We will be doing the things of God, and suddenly he will return. And heaven will be full, and it will be joyous. And, and guess what? What's going on out in the world is going to still be there. Transgender... Gender fluid, it's been around for ages. It's nothing new. Sin is nothing new. Right. Divorce, LGBTQ, whatever it might be, politics, nothing's new under the sun. But God's working. And you know how he's working? By us. We ourselves need to be living holy and godly lives. So we become the light. We become the word of God. We become the church, not in this building, but in the world. So people can go, hey, there may not be a God, but something happened to this person. Their life is transformed. I want to know what's going on over there. I want to see what's happening. I want to go talk to them. Because folks aren't going to come to church. They're not going to come sing praises. But they'll talk to you, and they'll talk to me outside of here when we right. live our lives. That's how we're to live. We need to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not treasures of earth. Matthew 6, 19 and 20 says this. We'll talk about this in closing. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's the goal. Storing up for yourselves heavenly treasures. And that is done by picking up the godly gems along the way. Reading your Bible, praying, talking with people, living a life. 
we can all we can all go to work and work. We can all buy the next bigger house or the sixty, eighty, ninety thousand dollar truck. I'm looking for a truck. <coughs> I was shocked. What they cost. But that's a that's a world of treasure. And sometimes we need them, and that's fine. But is where's our focus? Right. What are we storing up for ourselves? Imagine if all 15, 20 of us today really went out tomorrow and began to live like we're supposed to. Focusing on the powerful things of God. Yeah. Imagine next week, and we all brought one person that we've been talking to, there'd be 28 of us here. And then, well, we'll do that next week, and we bring out more, and all of a sudden we're 56. And then we're 100. And eventually, there's thousands in heaven. Because we've all just done what we're supposed to do. Right. And suddenly, then, the harvest is done. All the people who were going to come to know God have come to know God. Jesus returns, and all of a sudden, we're like, wow. What are you focused on? I've been reading in the Bible a lot, and like I was saying, everything I seem to read is always talking about the end times. And I realized that I was focusing so much on that, I was losing Let's refocus. Mm -hmm. We're going to go out there and we're going to get beat up. In the news, on the radio, there is a cancel culture. Don't worry about it. Let's focus on the things of God. Yeah. And then we can cancel out sin. And we can give hope. Because the cancel culture are the scoffers of the day. They don't want to be told that their life or it goes against the things of God. So let's not tell them. Let's not tell them. <laughs> let's just go out and live our life and let them come talk to us. We don't need to guilt and shame them. Let's just love them. Yeah. And be focused on the things of God. Mm -hmm. Let God straighten out them. Because then the day of the Lord will come. And it will be a joyous day. A glorious day, not a horrible day. I pray that the day comes when we all when we all get to heaven and we see people there that we spoke to, that we love, despite them making clothes. We're almost there. We're almost there. But let give, let's give God time to continue to work His plan. Mm -hmm. And may we be Let's go to the prayer. Almighty God, I don't want to confess my sins of sometimes losing my focus, of being so focused on the negative side of sin in this world that it gets depressing and it gets hard. But Lord, there's nothing new here. People have been making fun of Christians and people of faith for many years. So Lord, help us to pray for them, love them, care for them, and live like we should. Yeah. Let us live now, in this time, with holiness and godliness, <clears throat> focused on the powerful things of you, storing up treasures in mm heaven, -hmm. not worried about earthly pursuits. And when that happens, Lord, I know time will go so much faster because we're doing something we enjoy. And then suddenly, we'll be with you for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. Help us now, Lord, to remember we still got time. It's in Jesus' name I pray.